Hi and welcome to Puka Press. I'm in Merrion Square, which is one of the three Georgian squares in Dublin, and um, the others being Stevens Green and Fitzwilliam Square. Originally, this park would have been a closed park for the residents around. Uh, the reason we're here today is we're going to do a series of videos called Talking Statues. Um, and we thought that the first statue you would do is the most colourful statue in Dublin to probably one of Dublin's most colourful songs, Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde was born in this house on Westland Row in October 1854. The statue was made or was created by sculptor Danny Osborne and commissioned by Guinness Ireland Group. Since marble alone was deemed inadequate, the statue was formed from different colour stones from three continents. The torso was of green nephrite jade from British Columbia, Canada, and pink tulite from Norway. The legs are of Norwegian blue pearl granite, with the shoes being black Indian chocolate and finished with bronze shoelace tips. The statue wears a Trinity College tie made from glazed porcelain. The three rings, Wilde's wedding ring and two scarabs, one for good luck and the other bad luck. The statue you're looking at now is of Constance Wilde while she was pregnant. And the final statue is of Dionysus, Greek god of w wine and theatre. His father, William Wilde, was Ireland's leading ear and eye surgeon, who also published books on archaeology, folklore, and the satirist Jonathan Swift. His mother, Jane Francesca Wilde, was a nationalist poet and authority on Celtic myth and folklore, who wrote under the name Speranza. Wilde was one of three children. His elder brother, Willie, became a journalist, and his younger sister, Isola, sadly died of a fever when she was nine, almost ten. As a child, Wilde was baptised a Roman Catholic at his mother's behest. Despite his family's affiliation with the Anglican Church, presumably this was signified his mother's rejection of the Protestant landlord class and its values, since Wilde received no further education in the Catholic faith. After attending Pretoria Royal School in Enniskillen between 1864 and 71, he went on to a successful scholarship to Trinity College between 1871 and 1874 and Magdalen College in Oxford then between 1874 and 78, um, where he was awarded a degree with honours. During the four years, he distinguished himself not only as a classical scholar, a poser and a wit, but also a poet by winning the coveted Newdigate Prize in 1878 with a long poem, Ravenna. Like many of his generation, Wilde was determined to follow Walter Pater, the writer, urging to burn always with a hard gem-like flame. But Wilde also delighted in an effect in aesthetic pose. This, combined with rooms in Oxford de decorated with objets d'art, resulted in his famous remark, Oh, would that I could live up to my blue china. In the early 1800s, aestheticism was the rage and the despair of literary London. Wilde established himself in social and artistic circles by his wit and flamboyance. Soon the periodical punch made him a satiric object of its antagonism 
to the aesthetics for what they considered unmasculine devotion to art. And in their comic opera Patience, Gilbert and Sullivan based the character Butthorn, a fleshy poet, partly on Wilde. Wishing to reinforce the association, Wilde published at his own expense poems in 1881, which echoed too faithfully his discipleship to the poets Algernon Swinburne, Dante Gabriel Rossetti and John Keats. For further acclaim, Wilde agreed to lecture in the United States and Canada in 1882, announcing on his arrival at Customs in New York City that he had nothing to declare but my genius. Despite widespread hostility in the press to his languid poses and aesthetic costume of velvet jacket, knee breeches and black silk stockings, Wilde for 12 months exhorted the Americans to love beauty and art. Then he returned to Great Britain to lecture on his impressions of America. The year was 1884 and Asko Wilde was already something of a London celebrity. Though he had not yet published the plays that would earn him his spot among the Victorian literati, he had made a name for himself as aesthetic man about town and lecturer, with public views on everything aesthetic, including clothes. At the beginning of the year, he announced his engagement to Constance Lloyd, who he had met in Ireland some years earlier. Wilde married Constance, daughter of a prominent Irish barrister. Newspapers frothed about the news and appeared relieved that Wilde and his new wife would not be moving to Dublin. There was some fear lest London lose its lion and society its favourite source of admiration and ridicule. Two sons, Cyril and Vivian, were born in 1885 and 1886, respectively. Meanwhile, Wilde was a reviewer for the Pall Mall Gazette and then became editor of Woman's World between 1887 and 1889. During this period of apprenticeship as a writer, he published The Happy Prince and Other Tales, which revealed his gift for romantic allergy in the form of the fairy tale. You can never be overdressed or overeducated. Most modern women, or all modern women, who habitually wear trousers nowadays as a matter of course, might be surprised to know that they owe, in part at least, this freedom to Oscar and Constance Wilde. Wilde appeared in the newspapers in a series of letters published in the Pall Mall Gazette. He wrote about how women ought to dress. The following year in the New York Tribune, he published an essay, The Philosophy of Dress, in which he stressed the important relationship between clothing and one's soul. At that time, women commonly wore heavy restrictive underwear and long cumbersome skirts with crinolines or bustles. Corsets were certainly uncomfortable, but they could also be lethal, disforming skeletons, compromising fertility, and even driving internal organs into places they oughtn't have been. Despite that, people continued to wear them and to tight lace, ignoring doctors' concerns and claiming these devices improved posture. It was in this climate that people began to call for dress reform with some asserting that these courses were immodest and promoted the objectifying take on a woman's body. In time, dress and form would come to be seen as a crucial part of fighting women's, for women's equality. It's ironic, then, that many of the reformed clothes suggested as an alternative were themselves deemed shocking and morally questionable. Fashion is a form of ugliness so intolerable that we alter it every six months. Wilde's letters were strongly in favour of simple, comfortable outfits for women, with minimal fringes, flounces and kilting. More radically, he expressed his fondness for the divided skirt. This controversial article of clothing was essentially an extremely wild-legged pair of trousers. It had caused some anxiety in the British press, amid concerns that two-legged clothing for women would promote immoral ideals. The divided skirt, a trouser posing as a skirt, was a compromise of sorts. In a public letter, Constant Wilde's wife described it as trying to look as though it were not divided, 
on account of the intolerance of the British public. Those who did wear it loved the liberty it afforded them. One wearer described the delightful sense of freedom that resulted from the removal of petticoats. A few years earlier in 1881, Lady Frances Harberton had launched the British Arm of the Rational Dress Society, an organisation that later promised to promote the adoption according to individual taste and convenience of a style of dress based on considerations of health, comfort and beauty. <laughs> Staggeringly, it advocated for underwear that weighed under seven pounds. The society came four decades after Bloomer's craze in the 1850s, but similarly promoted towards the liberation of bifurcated leg cladding, the divided skirt. Wilde himself was unambiguous about the divided skirt, that it should not be ashamed of its own division, that the principle of the dress is good, that it is a step forward, perfection in women's clothing. If anything, he called for even more radicalism in women's legwear. If the divided skirt is to be of any positive value, it must give up all idea of being identical in appearance with an ordinary skirt, he wrote. It must diminish the moderate width of each of its divisions and sacrifice its foolish frills and flounces. The moment it imitates a dress, it is lost. But let it visibly announce itself as what it actually is, and it will go far forward towards solving a real difficulty. Indeed, he said that he would like to see women in some adaptation of the divided skirt or long or moderately loose knickerbockers. All the year before, Constance had become more and more confident as a dress reformer, wearing the divided skirt in public as proof that it could be an elegant, beautiful garment, worn in her case as part of a suit of striped Chervois wool trimmed with blue fur and bird's wings. In the final decade of his life, Wilde wrote and published nearly all of his major works. In his only novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, published in Lipcott's magazine in 1890 and in book form revised and expanded by six chapters in 1891, Wilde combined the supernatural elements of the Gothic novel with the unspeakable sins of French decadent fiction. The novel tells the story of an extraordinary beautiful young man, Dorian Gray, who is taken under the wing of an older, immoral man, Lord Henry Wotton. Entranced by Henry's views on art and sensuality, Dorian wishes to remain as young and handsome as a portrait of himself, painted by another admirer, Basil Halward. In time, the poetry changes and becomes hideous to reflect all of Dorian's sins and moral failings, while the flesh and blood Dorian remains entirely unchanged in appearance. Critics charged immorality despite Dorian's self-destruction. Wilde, however, insisted on the amoral nature of art regardless of the novel's apparently moral ending. This novel and the homoerotic nature of it would come back to haunt Oscar in later life, as we will see. Intentions in 1891, a collection of previously published essays, restated his aesthetic attitude towards art by borrowing ideas from the French poets Théophile Gautier, Charles Baudelaire, and the American painter James McNeil Whistler. In the same year, two volumes of stories and fairy tales also appeared, testifying to Wilde's extraordinary creative inventiveness. Lord Arthur Savile, Crime and Other Stories, and A House of Pomegranates. Wilde's greatest success were his society comedies. With the conventions of the French well-made play, with its social intrigues and artificial devices to resolve conflict, he implied his paradoxical epigrammatic wit to create a form of comedy new to 19th century English theatre. His first success, Lady Windermere's Fan, in 1892, demonstrated that his wit could revitalise the rusty machinery of the French drama. In the same year, rehearsals of his macabre play Salome, written in French, and designed, as he said, to make his audience shudder, 
by its depiction of unnatural passion, were halted by the censor because of a law that prohibited plays containing biblical characters. In the Bible, Salome is the daughter of Herodus and stepdaughter of Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee. At the instigation of her mother, she arranges for the execution of John the Baptist by asking for his head on a platter, as a reward for her dance before Herod. In Wilde's version, Salome lusts after John the Baptist and plots his death after he spawns her. After he is killed, she kisses his severed head. It was published in 1893 and an English translation appeared in 1894 with the English artist Aubrey Breasley's celebrated illustrations. A second society comedy, A Woman of No Importance, produced in 1893, convinced the critic William Archer that Wilde's plays must be taken on the very highest plane of modern English drama. In rapid succession, Wilde final plays An Ideal Husband and The Importance of Being Earnest were produced early in 1895. In the latter, his greatest achievement, the conventional elements of farce are transformed into satiric epigrams, seemingly trivial but mercilessly exposing Victorian hypocrisies. I suppose society is wonderfully delightful, to be in it merely a bore, but to be out of it simply a tragedy. I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read on the train. All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. That's his. I hope you have not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked and being really good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. Oscar Wilde wrote to a friend in 1885, I myself would sacrifice everything for a new experience. And I know there is no such thing as a new experience at all. In many of his works, exposure of a secret sin or indiscretion and consequent disgrace is a central design. If life imitated art as Wilde insisted in his essay, The Decay of Lying in 1889, he was himself proving this in his reckless pursuit of pleasure or as Wilde's grandson, Marilyn Holland, characterised it, a Faustian thirst for experience. About the time of his son Vivian's birth, Wilde began sexual relationship with a friend, Canadian journalist and art critic Robert Ross. It was the first in a series of secret affairs that he had with other men, culminating in his close and tempestuous friendship with Lord Alfred Douglas, known as Bosey, whom he had met in 1891 and who was 16 years younger than Wilde. Their relationship infuriated the Marcus of Queensbury, Douglas's father, a violent-tempered man whom Douglas despised. Accused by the Marcus of being a sodomite, Wilde, urged by Douglas, sued the Marquis for criminal libel, rather imprudently as it turned out. The case went to trial in 1895. Wilde's case collapsed within three days, when the evidence went against him. His writings were called into question, particularly as we mentioned before, the picture of Dorian Gray with its homoerotic themes, and it was revealed that Wilde had solicited the service of male sex workers, although initially at Douglas's origin. Wilde dropped the suit but the evidence made him vulnerable to arrest for having violated Britain's Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1885, which criminalised sex acts between men, though not between women. He was urged to flee by his friends to France, but Wilde refused, unable to believe that his world was at an end. He was arrested and ordered to stand trial for acts of gross indecency. Wilde testified brilliantly, drawing applause and some hisses, after giving an eloquent speech about the love that dare not speak its name, an expression in Douglas's poem Two Loves. Interpreting it as a coy reference to homosexuality, the prosecution demanded that Wilde explain its meanings. He characterised it in part as a great affection of an elder for a younger man, such as Plato made the very basis of his philosophy and such as you find in sonnets of Michelangelo and Shakespeare. 
it is that deep spiritual affection that is pure as it is perfect. But the jury failed to reach a verdict. In the retrial he was found guilty and sentenced in May 1895 to two years hard labour. To regret one's own experience is to arrest one's own development. To deny one's own experience is to put a lie into the lips of one's own life. It is no less than a denial of the soul. Oscar Wilde wrote this in De Pundus in 1905, showing that he didn't really regret anything. Most of his sentence was served at Reading Jail, where he wrote a long letter to Douglas, published in 1905. In a drastically cut version of De Pundus, filled with recrimination against the younger man for encouraging him in his dissipation and distraction from his work. Yet the letter also expressed wild spirituality with elegant ruminations on suffering, repentance and the true life of Christ and the true life of the artist. To avoid scandal, Constant Wilde moved to Europe and changed the family surname to Holland. They corresponded often through letters, however, and she visited him once in prison after the death of his mother in 1896. She died in Genoa, Italy in 1898, several days after a botched operation that was meant to resolve a uterine tumour. Contemporary medical evidence suggests that she was misdiagnosed and in fact had MS multiple sclerosis. In 1987, Wilde was released from prison, a bankrupt, and immediately went to France, ironically as that was where he was urged to go in the first place, hoping to regenerate himself as a writer. His only remaining work, however, was the Ballad of Reading Jail. He did not wear his scarlet coat, for blood and wine are red, and blood and wine were on his hands when they found him with the dead, the poor dead woman that he loved and murdered in her bed. He walked among the trial men in suit of shabby grey. A cricket cap was on his head and his step seemed light and gay. But I never saw a man who looked so wistfully that day. He walked among the trial men in a suit of shabby grey. A cricket cap was on his head and his step seemed light and gay. But I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at a day. I never saw a man who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue which prisoners call the sky and every drifting cloud that went with sails of silver by. I walked with other souls in pain within another ring and was wondering if the man had done a great or little thing when a voice behind me whispered low that fellows got to swing. They Christ the very prison walls suddenly seemed to reel and the sky above my head became like a cask of scorching steel and though i was a soul in pain my pain i could not feel i only knew what hunt had taught quickened his step and why he looked upon the garish day with such a wistful eye the man had killed the thing he loved and so he had to die yet each man kills the thing he loved by each let this be heard some do it with a bitter look, some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss, the brave man with a sword. Some kill their love when they are young, and 
and some when they are old. Some strangle with the hands of lust, some with the hands of gold. The kindest use a knife because the dead so soon grow cold. Some love too little, some too long. Some sell and others buy. Some do the deed with many tears and some without a sigh. For each man kills the one he loves, yet each man does not die. The poem goes on for quite a few more stanzas, revealing his concern for the inhumane prison conditions. Despite constant money problems, he maintained, as George Bernard Shaw said, an unconquerable gaiety of soul that sustained him. And he was visited by such loyal friends as Max Beardham and Robert Ross, who would become his literary executor. He was also reunited with Douglas. Wilde died suddenly of acute meningitis, brought on by an ear infection, most likely. In his semi-conscious final moments, he was received into the Roman Catholic Church, which he had long admired. A wit to the end, his reputed last words were, my wallpaper and I are fighting a duel to the death. One of the other of us has to go. Death must be so beautiful to lie in the soft brown earth with the grasses waving above one's head and listen to silence. To have no yesterday and no tomorrow. To forget time, to forgive life, to be at peace. Oscar Wilde's grave in the cemetery Du Pierre Lachey in Paris has a glass barrier around it because of the damage that has been done to it by lipstick marks by the many female admirers who attended his burial place. In 2017, Wilde was among 50,000 men who were posthumously pardoned under the Turing Law. This law was named after the British mathematician and logician Alan Turing who was convicted of gross indecency in 1952 and treated abominably by the British establishment despite most people would accept shortening World War II by years. The law was introduced to exonerate individuals had, who had been unjustly convicted of homosexual crimes that no longer exist. I will leave you with a few of Oscar's most famous quotes. Be yourself, everyone else is taken. We are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. And one that we should take note of today. A thing is not necessarily true because a man dies for it. And lastly, I would, if you enjoy this video, please subscribe and hit the like button and most importantly the notification bell because we are going to do um, many more statues from Dublin, the rest of Ireland and indeed the UK also. The stories behind them, the stories behind the person in the statue or monument for good or ill. And... I will finally leave you with a quote, one of my favourite quotes by Gwendolyn in The Importance of Being Earnest. If you are not too long, I will wait here for you all my life. I hope to see you again soon. I hope you enjoyed the video. Slán agus Goodbye.